nutritionist uh, and acupuncturist and um, uh, I do many other things such as uh, hormone testing and food sensitivity testing which I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, but today I want to talk about um, Today, what that means? Yeah. For some reason, I'm also not working. Um, I also do hormone testing. That's uh, saliva hormone testing. So anyone who's dealing with uh, hormonal imbalances, whether it's like PMS type symptoms or even menopausal symptoms, um, I do do uh, testing for that. Um, acupuncture. Uh, acupuncture I use for many things, not uh, just for pain, which is a wonderful tool for pain, for pain but I also use it for things like digestive uh, issues. Uh, I also do detoxing programs, and that could be anything from just changing up the diet to actually doing things like herbs, uh, or even doing um, uh, homeopathics. And then the last one should be cooking classes. So I also offer cooking classes. Now I am from the Markham area, um, so I'm a bit far, but if you go to the next slide, I will be hosting a cooking class here in Kirkwood. Um, it is wheat-free, it's actually gluten-free, but a wheat-free, dairy-free, and egg-free class. And so if anybody's interested, um, stop by my booth and pick up a, a little flyer, and just email me or call if you're interested in attending. I'm also the author of um, dairy-free cookbook, and it is available on my website, oasishealth.ca, or you can go to amazon.com or amazon.ca, um, and you can find my book there. Uh, also, if you haven't stopped by my booth, I do have some gluten-free samples available for uh, people to try if you're interested. I also have done several uh, shows on Rogers TV as a community producer, and um, you can actually watch full one-hour episodes uh, of my shows on, on my website, so again, oasishealth.ca. And uh, the topics um, mainly are related to digestive uh, issues, because I like to deal with digestive issues. Um, but there's also different episodes on there with brain, brain food and things like that. So if you're interested, you can go online and look at those. Okay, so today I want to talk about intestinal health. And being a practitioner for over 10 years, um, I have dealt with a lot of people who come in with digestive type issues. Um, so what is gut health or what is good digestive health? Really what that means is um, um, basically a, a good digestive system or good gut health basically has to do with how well your body is, is using the food that, it, that you're eating. So from beginning to end, so by the time, from the time you put it into your mouth from, and to the time that it leaves your body, there should be no discomfort anywhere in your body. So that's good digestive health. If there's problems anywhere, whether it be heartburn, whether it be stomach aches, whether it be gas or bloating, that tells me there's some sort of imbalance somewhere in the body. And um, statistically speaking, in Canada, there's more than 20 million Canadians that suffer from digestive disorders every year. And that's based on the Canadian Digestive Health Association. Okay, so I want to take a little tour of the digestive tract just so that you have an idea of where I'm coming from. So the digestive tract basically starts from the mouth. So the times we chew our food, we actually release um, salivary enzymes, and it also stimulates um, tells the body that digestion is taking place and the other organs will be prepared for digestion. So once we chew our food, it will travel down the esophagus, obviously, and then into our stomach. And once the food enters the stomach, now the stomach is the only, we call it an organ, um, that is acidic in the body. All, in general, our body is supposed to be alkaline, um, you know, different organs are alkaline, our small intestines are alkaline, large intestines are alkaline, but the stomach is really the only place that's very acidic. And the reason why it's so acidic is, is for a number of reasons. Number one, it helps to break down our proteins, which is really important. But it
but it also helps to kill and um, basically kill off pathogens, so viruses, bacteria, parasites, things that are on our food or in our food that, that could harm us. The, the strong acidity in the stomach is there to help kill them so that they, they don't harm us um, once it passes the stomach. And then the stomach will continue to kind of churn and kind of mix up our food and then it will eventually go into the small intestine. Okay, so once it goes into the small intestine, now interestingly enough, the small intestine is about 22 feet in length and the large intestine is only about 5 feet in length. And the reason why they're called small and large intestine is not the length of it, it's, it's the, I guess, the, the, the diameter, right? So the small intestine is small, where the large intestine is going to be much bigger. So a smaller tube, bigger tube. So the small intestine, so Again, the food has now gone into our stomach, it's going to leave our stomach and go into the small intestine. And the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And this is where bile from the gallbladder or the liver um, and enzymes from our pancreas secrete into that beginning part of the small intestine to help us further break down our food. Um, the absorption of our food really takes place in the small intestine. So if we do not have enough bile, let's say we don't have gallbladder, um, we still make bile, but the body doesn't concentrate it, so we might not have enough bile. Um, if we eat a lot of cooked foods or um, enzyme deficient foods, like a lot of processed foods, then we may not have enough enzymes to help us break down our food. And Again, because this is where the absorption of our nutrients take place, if we're not breaking down that food, you can't possibly absorb the nutrients from it. And so this is where a lot of digestive issues start to take place, um, is in the small intestine. And another um, important fact about the small intestine is that that's where a majority, more than 50% of our immune system is. So if we're having problems within that small intestine, um, it can lead to immune system problems, it can lead to digestive problems, it will most likely lead to you know, gas, bloating, maybe it will lead to candida, maybe dysbiosis or leaky gut, all these, all, all these different things that can happen just, just because of the small intestine not being able to utilize the food properly. So once the uh, food travels through the small intestine, it will eventually end up in the large intestine. Now the large intestine, there's no absorption of food happening at this point, or nutrients at this point, um, but there's a lot of bacteria in the large intestine, and actually that bacteria is meant to be there to further um, help us break down our food or, or break down what's left. And, um, and the other thing that large, uh, large happens in the large intestine is that water is absorbed. So that's why when we have a bowel movement or we make stool, it's, it's not supposed to be liquid, right? So if it's liquid, then that means there's, there's an imbalance in the intestines, so water's not being absorbed properly. Um, or if there's a lot of gas and bloating, especially with odor, it tells me there's an imbalance with the amount of bacteria in the, in the large intestine. And that's okay. So obviously once it's done with the large intestine, we eliminate what's left, right? Okay, so let's talk about why there, why there is so much digestive issues out there. Uh, probably the most prominent would have to be antibiotic use. So when someone takes antibiotics, <coughs> you have to remember antibiotics cannot distinguish between good and bad bacteria. Its role is to just kill bacteria. So all that good bacteria that's supposed to be lining our intestines, that gets destroyed whenever you do antibiotics. And um, studies show that just doing one round of antibiotics will take approximately 18 months to replenish that good bacteria. So imagine, yes. What about the SARS and the Alfred? Exactly. So you need to replace that good bacteria with good probiotics. And um, so you have to remember, if, you're, if you've taken antibiotics, even if you took antibiotics 20 years ago, you could have started the whole ball rolling at that point. And, and now things are just accumulating and getting a little bit worse. So antibiotics, um, if you 
are, if you have to take antibiotics or you've taken antibiotics, you absolutely should be on some sort of probiotic, which is just good bacteria. Now, a lot of people will do yogurts and think, oh, I'm getting my probiotics through yogurt. Um, unfortunately, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, yogurt is dairy. And dairy is one of those foods that can actually cause a lot of digestive issues. So just doing um, yogurt may not, may not fix the problem. So um, again, probiotics is probably a better choice. Uh, the next point, low stomach acids. Remember I was telling you the stomach is really acidic and it's meant to be very acidic? A lot of people, especially as we age, we actually start to make less hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And when, we, when that happens, what happens with our food is the food kind of just sits in the stomach a little too long. And so what end, what's end up, what ends up happening is this food just kind of sits there and it doesn't really digest properly and it sits for too long and then it ferments and it starts to kind of cause like reflux. So it's this acidity in the body which people start to feel as acid reflux. But what, what do most people do when they have acid reflux? They take, they take an antacid, so they try and buffer everything. But the original problem was there wasn't enough acid to begin with. So, so what I have my clients do is if they do suffer from acid reflux or just food kind of just you feel like your food is sitting in your stomach too long, it's not really digesting properly, is to take a digestive enzyme. And what this will do, it will help you digest your food faster and better and it will alleviate that acid reflux that people are getting from having not enough hydrochloric acid in the body. So remember I was talking about the small intestine is where we absorb our nutrients. So if we have low stomach acid and we take an antacid, so now food enters into the small intestine, we, we're, we're not going to be absorbing as many of those nutrients because we're just not breaking down the food enough. Okay, next. And then uh, eating refined processed foods. Um, you know, when you take nutrients out of food, obviously there's nothing for the body to absorb from it. Um, when we eat pro a lot of processed foods, we're actually lacking fiber. And fiber is really important because um, fiber well, helps, to help, helps us to move our stool through the body, but it also feeds that good bacteria in the intestinal tract. So a lot of times if people are suffering from constipation, that's why fiber is so good. A lot of times constipation is just not enough bulk to move food through, but it also might be just because there's not enough bacteria there to help that whole digestive process. And those are the, some of the main reasons why people have digestive issues, whatever the issues may be. Oh, and I should here talk about food sensitivities today, so I should mention that food sensitivities uh, and intolerances is the other reason why um, there are digestive issues out there. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the difference between an allergy and a sensitivity. So when someone has an allergy to a food, um, the symptoms are quite obvious. You can actually go to the screen. Um, the, the symptoms are quite obvious, right? If someone has an allergy to shellfish, they eat some shellfish, they're going to probably know within a few moments that they have an allergy. Maybe they might have shortness of breath, maybe they get hives, maybe they get, maybe they can go into anaphylactic shock, for some people it can even be deaf. So most people are aware of their allergies. And when we talk about allergies, what happens in the blood is that there's an immune reaction happening in the blood, and there's something called IgE. So it's an antibody that, that the body is releasing. So that's, that's the specific marker that's that's happening in the blood to let us know that there is an allergy happening. So for the next one. And we've talked about the symptoms. So the symptoms are quite obvious. Um, you know, hives, burns, itching, breathing difficulties. And next one. And then, of course, the, the most severe reaction would be the anaphylactic shock or even death. Now that's an allergy. Most people are, are going to be aware they have an allergy. Whereas a sensitivity, which is the next one, <laughs> so a sensitivity is much different. So it still involves an immune reaction, but it's different antibodies. And, and 
the reaction is now not an immediate reaction, it's called a delayed immune reaction. So if someone is having a reaction to a food, it can take hours, it can even take days for that reaction to happen in the body. And, and it's not obvious symptoms. So some people might have increased joint pain the next day after eating a piece of bread. They might not connect that yesterday I had a piece of bread and now I have joint pain. For someone else it might be constipation, migraines, fatigue, fluid retention, which I see a lot of, um, even anxiety. Uh, eczema, skin issues is very big in terms of um, food sensitivities, being congested all the time, um, hyperactivity, chronic inflammation. So, so that you can see the symptoms are very different, right? You might wake up with joint pain and not realize that, that it was something that you ate a couple days ago. Um, okay, so uh, I was talking about our immune system being in the small intestine. So a majority of our immune system is in our digestive tract. So it's really important to, to be aware of where the imbalances are in the body. If you do have gas, bloating, um, you know, joint pain, arthritis, uh, any any sort of health issue, you have to you have to think about the digestive system because again, that's where our immune system is. Unfortunately, um, our doctors aren't really ready to to recognize that food sensitivities can affect um, different diseases out there or sim symptoms out there. Um, irritable bowel, celiac, Crohn's, um, those are. You know, you would think food, but rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of people don't really necessarily relate that to food. Uh, colitis, eczema, psoriasis, fibromyalgia, which I see a lot of, um, even lupus, MS, heart disease, that, those could all be linked to food sensitivities. Okay, so statistically, um, clones, uh, clones, colitis, <laughs> IBS, <laughs> diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, those are all uh, strongly linked to this IgG or the food sensitivity. Um, again, these are Canadian statistics, so Canadian Digestive Health Foundation. So in 2008, there was an estimated 250,000 Canadians with IBD, which is irritable bowel disease, Crohn's and colitis. And then 5 million Canadians suffer from IBS, which is irritable bowel sy syndrome. Now, for me, irritable bowel syndrome is not a diagnosis, it's really just a description. That, that's the way I view it. Something is irritating the bowel, but that's not, that's not your diagnosis. You can't go home and say, oh, I just have IBS. Right? There's something that's irritating the bowel. So we need to figure out what it is that, that's irritating it. And uh, the other statistic was 120,000 Canadians are diagnosed each year with, with some sort of Yes. Right, so it's, it's getting worse, not better. Okay, so a lot of people are probably wondering, okay, how do you find out what my sensitivities are? So there's different ways to test. Um, I have a machine called uh, an electrodermal screening machine. Uh, it's also known as EDS. Uh, also, some people know it as biofeedback. Um, but basically, it's energetically measuring. It's a computerized test. And it measures energy at the different acupuncture points on your hands and on your feet. Now, each meridian in the body, in Chinese medicine, relates to a different organ. So this would be the large intestine meridian, this might be the heart meridian, the small intestine meridian, and on the foot is the liver, the stomach, the kidneys, the bladder. So, so what, what happens with this test is um, I'm measuring the energy, and then depending on how, how balanced or imbalanced you are, it will show us on a graph. So at the end of all the testing, I will see, so, uh, imagine this, this green bar here to be balanced, so there's no real issue. Um, but if I take a reading and it doesn't make it into the, into the balanced area, that tells me there's a weakness in that area. Maybe it's an organ, maybe it's meridian. And if it goes above the green, that tells me there's stress. So there's something stressing that organ or that meridian. And, and that's a great test. It's about an hour long, and at the end of the, the treatment, you get a report. So all, everything I've tested in terms of organs, meridians, and then I also test food with this one. So you'll, you'll get a report of everything I've tested, what foods are weakening you, what foods are, are stressing you, and what foods are sort of balanced and not really affecting you. So that's one way to get tested for food sensitivities. The next screen. The next test is called the
called blood spot test. And this is where we actually take blood, um, and it's just a fingerprint. So I, there's a, it's a little kit that we have, and we take some blood, and we saturate some um, strips that get sent off to a lab. And it takes about a month to get the report back. And what this test is doing, it's actually testing for those antibodies. So when we eat a food and it's creating this inflammation in the body, it creates these little markers, so IgG or IgA, and, and this is what the blood <coughs> test is looking for. Okay, how much of a reaction are you having to specific foods? So this is just one category. So this is the dairy category. So if it's in this first column here, we're going to assume there's really no reaction that's going on inside the body. But the longer the bar, the more, the se more severe the reaction, um, and if we do nothing about it, it will eventually do damage to our tissues. So that's when we might get into actually like rheumatoid arthritis, or we might get into lupus or an MS, or even celiac disease at some point. Right? So it's a great way to test. It tests 96 different foods. So dairy, it tests um, some meat, some fish, uh, eggs, coffees, yeast, um, and then our gluten and meat products and fruits and vegetables. So it's, it's a great little test. It, um, it's a little bit more expensive, um, but it's a great way to kind of see what's happening inside your body. The next test is also a blood test, um, and this one is done through uh, a blood draw. So this is where a nurse will actually come to the home um, with her kit, and she'll draw blood. Uh, again, it takes about a month for the results, and you'll get a report back, uh, again, saying uh, what your sensitivities are. The difference between this test and the previous test is that this test is actually looking at how the cell reacts when it comes into contact with Food, whereas the other one is looking for inflammation. So they're both great tests. It really just depends if you like your blood drawn, or if you don't mind your finger prick, or if you don't want to do blood altogether, then you do the first test, the EDS. I'm just interested why it takes a month to get the blood drawn. It's just the amount of time it takes to process so in the lab. Is that detailed uh, testing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so based on my past 10 years of, of working with clients. So the first column, these are going to be the main foods that come up most of the time. And these are both common to people with food allergies and people with food sensitivities. Wheat and dairy, top of the list. This is why I wrote the cookbook, because I, I just see so many clients with those issues. And um, the cookbook was really there just to help them to kind of you know, change their diet. Um, eggs is very common, peanuts, uh, other tree nuts, uh, shellfish, sesame seeds. So those are really common foods that I would see quite regularly. And then the second column, those are foods that I find come up often. So yeast um, and sugar come up quite often. Um, and usually when they come up together, um, that tells me there's, there's probably a candida issue going on also. And candida is just an overgrowth of... of, of fungus, if you will, um, in the body, and uh, it can create a lot of problems in the body. So generally, if I see yeast and sugar come up together on one of those tests, then I'm going to assume that um, candida is an issue, and we would work on that. Uh, bananas and pineapple also, for some reason, come together. I usually don't have someone that has just a banana sensitivity or a pineapple. They always come together, and I don't know why, what the connection is, but um, I see that often. Cranberries also comes up often in garlic. So, you know, sometimes it's not, it's not that we're eating bad foods that's causing digestive issues. Sometimes it's perfectly healthy foods, but our bodies just, for whatever reason, don't know how to break them down or, or use them properly. What are the percentages of false positives? With the blood? With the, with the blood, it's pretty accurate. It's very, it probably, I would say, 80s, 90. And uh, how, how do we know for sure that it's wheat and not something that was sprayed on the wheat exactly. or on dairy products or even peanuts? Peanut allergies are yes. growing. Mm -hmm. How is it peanut allergy is now more than before? Are they really allergic to peanuts or maybe something else that is on the It's peanuts? very true. So a lot of times with peanuts, people are actually reacting to the mold that's on the peanuts. Yes, I know. Yes. 
And uh, in terms of wheat or gluten, um, uh, going back to the accuracy of the test, if someone's been following a wheat-free, dairy-free diet or a gluten-free diet, um, when you do the blood work, it, it, it will not show, even if you have an issue with it, it will not show because you just don't have those foods in your body, right? So the, these, the blood tests are best if you, if you just are right now just eating anything and everything, if you're not really avoiding things. So if you avoid wheat, as an example, and you do the test and wheat does not come up, does not necessarily mean you don't have sensitivity to that wheat. It just means it's not in your system enough for it to be causing, um, you know, a, enough inflammation for the test to, to catch it. But you're right. Things can all can always be contaminated, right? Uh, with, you know, with because the most things these days are exactly. Yeah. So, but it depends also. But the nice thing I like about the testing is even when someone is avoiding meat or dairy and they do the test and still wheat and dairy come up, that's a good indicator that they're still getting it in, whether it's through, for, whether it's through contamination or whether it's hidden in food that they're eating, right? So it, it does tell us a lot of information. Uh, next test, next. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do to, to improve our gut health? So we talked a little bit earlier about probiotics, right? Probiotics being healthy bacteria. Um, you want to make sure you're getting a good probiotic. Um, I, I take it on a daily basis. Um, I, I can't see why not. It's good bacteria. But you can get it through supplement or you can actually get it through food. Right? So we talked about yogurt, which is not my favorite, but it does contain some good bacteria. But there's things like um, raw sauerkraut, which is a great way to, to get good bacteria in, and enzymes, um, kombucha teas, which is a sold in the refrigerator section. So there's different ways to get good bacteria in if you don't want to take a, a supplement. Um, eating foods that are raw are great because they have enzymes. And enzymes are necessary for us to break down food, also necessary for us to be alive. <laughs> Without enzymes, nothing would be happening. We would be dead. Um, and so going back to eating a lot of cooked foods or processed foods, we're, we're not getting a lot of enzymes. And that can cause digestive issues because we we will what will happen is the pancreas will exhaust the pancreas which means our enzymes and that can lead to digestive issues on on, on its own there. Um, test for food sensitivities if you if you have any of those symptoms that we talked about earlier it is a good idea to test for food sensitivities. Um, for some people who maybe find the testing too expensive, you can also do elimination type diets, right? So you eliminate some of the more um, um, common food sensitivities like the wheat and the dairy and the eggs and things like that, soy products. And, and, but the key is you have to do it for a long enough period of time so that when you reintroduce that food, um, you'll almost know immediately whether that food bothers you or not, whether it's more joint pain or whether it's constipation or a migraine, whatever it may be. Um, and work with someone that can help you, um, guide you through through the whatever process you decide to take, whether it's elimination or whether it's a blood test, um, that type of thing. So, um, uh, let's see what else we have. So, yeah, um, so I am in Markham. I'm a bit far. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that <clears throat> uh, when you talk about probiotics and yogurt, a lot of the yogurt found in the market is kind of candy yogurt, mm -hmm. and therefore it's does not have the yes. probiotic. If you really want to have yogurt which is healthy probiotic, you make your own yogurt. It is very Absolutely. easy to do. Absolutely. I, I and therefore, a lot of the yogurts, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you say it's not your favorite, it's my favorite because <laughs> I make mine all the time. Beautiful. But yes. um, a lot of it is dead yogurt. It is, it is. So, uh, and it's pasteurized and everything else, right? Yeah. So, there's really Again, it's not my favorite. I don't like people. And there's gum and gum carrageen and other things yeah. that are added to it. Yes, so. and sugars and, and things like that, right? So, yeah, if you, you can make your own yogurt, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was I saying? So, yeah, so if um, I, I do uh, work with people online through email, um, like I said, I, I will be coming into town often to do cooking classes, so we can always. Um, um, you know, connect in that way. Um, but I'll give you all a card. These are 
a probiotic that you would recommend? I generally use the Genestra line um, of probiotics. Um, but generally, I would say anything that's found in the refrigerated section of the health food store uh, will most likely be a better probiotic. Acidophilus. So acidophilus is one strain, right? So when you buy a probiotic, it's many different strains of, of bacteria. So acidophilus is one, bifidus is another. So you you can find, you know, some bottles will have like 10 different strains of probiotics, you know, or you can just go and get acidophilus. So it's just, it, it really just depends on who's making the probiotic and which strains they, strain they, they want to use. Mm -hmm. right? And infants can get a different probiotic. Health store. Yes, health food store, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, don't, don't go to the drugstore you know, and grocery store and buy one that's been sitting on the shelf. But, uh, probiotics are live bacteria. So if they've been sitting on a shelf, I'm going to assume they're not live. No. no. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.